let's, uh, let's get some energy going and let's say praise the Lord and God bless Sister Lisa. She comes in for kids talk. Thank you, Lord. Kids talk, kids talk, kids talk. <laughs> it's not about me, it's what about we're learning, kids talk. All right, how is everybody doing this morning? It's good to see you all, it's good to see your smiling faces, yay. All right, let's start off right away by going into the word of God. Let's have everyone stand up and we're going to turn to Isaiah 55. And as I was looking this over, I kept being like, we'll just read verse 6, 7, and 8, and well, 9 is good too. Might as well go to 10. We're just going to read all the way down to 13, because it's good stuff. Isaiah 55, we're going to start at 6, but we're going to read all the way down to 13. I'm going to give you a second to flip. I like seeing so many flip Bibles, actual page Bibles. That's good. But it's so much easier for me just to click, click, click on my phone. <laughs> So I have my phone out there all the time. All right, is everybody good? Isaiah 55, 6 through 13 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. I mean, how many times in the last several services, the last months of services, have we heard the time is now, the time is now, the time is now? Right. We're trying to drill this into our brain. The time is now. We have no hope of tomorrow. Seek the Lord now. Verse 7 let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our Lord God and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. He will have what on us if we turn to him? Mercy, like we talked about in Sunday school, kiddos. We all learn the sign, mercy upon us when we turn to him. We don't have to run. We don't have to be afraid. Mercy to us. Verse 8. For he's, God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Thank goodness that he knows more than we do. He knows it all. We can trust in him. Verse 10, for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Whatever God's plan is, it will come to pass. You can count on it. Verse 12, for ye, now it's about us, for ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. Who doesn't need joy and peace in their life? Even the most joyful and peaceful of us can still use some more on a daily basis because of the world we live in. Still in verse 12, the mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up a fir tree, and instead of a briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. What good promises if we just turn to him now. Now is the time, right? Joy and peace and good coming out of the bad. Thank you, Jesus, for your promises, Lord. Thank you for teaching us, even through object lessons and through kids' talk, to draw closer to you, to see who you are. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. All right, don't sit down yet, because while you're standing, what am I going to make you do? <laughs> don't sit down yet. <laughs> I'm going to make you sing, right? I'm going to make you sing. All right. So it's time for us not to give up. It's not time for us not to go our separate ways. It's time for us to come together and focus on the Lord Jesus. So we're going to sing our old song, Let Us Come Together, Praise the Name of Jesus, because now is the time for us to do that, right? Yeah. So those of you who know this song know you need a partner at the end for hallelujah, clapping hands. If you don't have a partner or you're not comfortable touching someone's hands, it's hallelujah, you all have your own two hands that you can clap, okay? All right, nice and loud and proud, giving praise to the Lord. Let us come together, praise the name of Jesus. All the people of the earth come and see. 
Let us come together, praise the name of Jesus. All the people of the earth come and hear. For joy is like the sunshine raining down upon us. Joy is like the golden crown. So let us come together, praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Faster, let us come together. Praise the name of Jesus. All the people of the earth come and see. Let us come together. Praise the name of Jesus. All the people of the earth come and hear. For joy is like the sunshine raining down upon us. Joy is like the golden crown. So let us come together. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the name of Jesus. I give him praise. I give him praise. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated as soon as you're done praising the Lord. That's what we are coming together for. It is time to give the Lord Jesus what he's due. It's not about us. It's about him. He is due every single one of us because he wants us. He called us. He paid for us. He saved us. He died on the cross for us. He wants us and he's due. Now is the time. Now is the time. So this morning, we learned about mercy in Sunday school. And this is how you say mercy in sign language. Hands up, middle fingers down, and then in a circle like this. Mercy. So if you are getting mercy, it goes to you. If you guys are getting mercy, it goes to you. If you guys are getting mercy, it goes to you. If I am getting mercy, it goes to me. And the Lord Jesus gives us mercy and mercy and mercy continually, right? We can turn to him at any time, and I'm so glad for that. So this morning I was thinking of what do I do to deserve mercy? Nothing. Absolutely nothing, right? So what do I need to do to put myself in a position of receiving mercy? Just turn to him. Seek him. Like our Bible verse said from last week, seek him and ye shall live. So I need to be giving of myself to him. I need to be seeking him. Because even if I seek him, I just can't sit back and be like, oh, there he is. I found him. Let me learn about him. I have to give him of myself, right? And that reminded me of the story that most of us are familiar with of the little boy who gave Jesus his lunch gave him his five loaves and his two fishes. Jesus was teaching the multitude. There was over 5,000 people there, I think 5,000 men, and then the children on top of that and the women and so many people that Jesus was teaching. And it came time for them to be fed, and no one had food to share with everybody. The thousands of people there needed to be fed, and there wasn't food enough for thousands of people. So one little boy offered his lunch to the Lord Jesus. But I got to thinking about that. What are the odds that that was the only food in those thousands of people in that crowd? Let me see a show of hands. Does anybody have food with them right now? Does anybody have any food? Does anyone have an energy bar, a granola bar, pack of peanuts, anything? In the truck, okay. I can tell you back in the office there's some snacks just in case. Philby and I talk about it all the time. Why don't we have snacks in here when we're working till midnight and stuff? We need our snacks. We still haven't done it, though. What is our deal? We need to do this, right? In that big group of people, I, I mean, I, this is not in the Bible. This is my opinion, but certainly somebody had, like, an apple in their bag or some loaves of bread or something, especially if there was kids and mothers. Mothers are going to make sure their kids have some snacks if they're out all day. So why didn't all that food come up to Jesus? When the disciples went around to find out what was there, what they could have for lunch, why didn't that come up? Why did people withhold what they had? This little boy didn't withheld what he had. He said, well, I mean, this can't feed all the thousands, but here it is, Jesus. You can have it. Whatever I have, you can have. So what is holding us back? 
What makes us hold back from giving all that we have to the Lord? What could it be? Are we not giving all of our finances, all of our time, all of our talents, all of our life? Is it because we're afraid then we'll lack if we give it to Jesus? This little boy wasn't afraid that he would lack. He's like, here, take the whole thing. He didn't keep one back for himself. He said, Jesus, take the whole thing. And in that, Jesus made the miracle. We know he broke and broke and broke and broke until everybody was fed and there was leftovers. Everybody was full. Everybody was fed and there was 12 baskets full, one for each of the disciples, noting that Jesus didn't have a basket for himself, which is the message all in and of itself. But what is holding us back? Are we the ones in the crowd who have the apple or the energy bar in our pocket and we're not offering it up to the Lord Jesus? So just for a simple object, in case this is you, in case you are holding back something from the Lord, whatever it may be, it could be the normal things that we think of like our finances, our time, our talents, some piece of our heart, some piece of our life that we're not willing to submit to the Lord yet, whatever it is, some of it can be that we're afraid we won't have enough for ourselves. We're afraid we'll miss out on something. We're afraid it's all about me, 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 right? But I just want to show you quickly with this very easy object lesson to help remember that you can't outgive the Lord. He will never be beholden to us. There will never be a time when we're like, the Lord owes me. It's just not going to happen. He gives and he gives and he gives freely. So I need someone to come up and just do this simple thing. All you have to be able to do is cut. All right, Sid, come on up. And we're going to do some more cutting. I hope when you came in, you got some scissors and your paper so you can follow along the next activity. But this is just going to be real simple. So this paper is going to be like our life, okay? Think this is you. So you can choose. Are you going to keep your life to yourself? Are you going to keep everything that you have to yourself? Or are you going to give it to the Lord? If you give it to the Lord, he is going to give and give and give. You will never be missing. You will never miss out. So, Sydney, I would like for you to represent giving to the Lord, just cutting off a corner, and then give it to me, even though I'm not the Lord. I know you're all shocked by that. Thank you. Okay. So, we started with how many corners of this paper? One, two, three, four, right? Sid, how many corners do we have now that you gave one to Jesus? Oh, five. Look at that. You give some to the Lord, now you have five. All right, cut off another corner. Give some more to the Lord Jesus. So we had five. How many do we have now that you gave two corners to the Lord? Six. Started with four, now we have six. You see where this is going? All right, let's do another corner. Now how many corners? She gave three corners to the Lord. How many does she have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. seven corners. All right, let's give him another corner. I'll grab it. How many corners do we have now? She gave the Lord four corners of her life. What do we have? Count again. We got eight. That's right. You went around one more. We have eight corners. We went from four to eight. Do you see the object lesson here? You can't outgive the Lord. You're not going to be missing. You're not going to be lacking. The Lord Jesus is going to return to you more than double, more than fourfold. Whatever you need, he's going to return to you. So you will not be without. We can never outgive the Lord. Thank you, Sydney. Thank you very much. You can have a seat. Thanks. All right, so that could be one of the reasons that we're holding back is we're, we're afraid we won't have enough. We're afraid that we won't have what we need, that we will be lacking. But how many of us, that's not the reason we're holding a piece of our life back or something back from the Lord, but it's because we're afraid that we can't do it. We're afraid of failure. We're afraid that we will commit to the Lord and then mess it up. We're afraid we can't. I have been there many a time. I'm afraid I can't. I'm in something right now that the Lord's asked me to do. I'm afraid I can't. But you know the truth of the matter is we can't. We can't. But who can? He can. So when he asks you to do it, he can do it. In our weakness, he gives us strength to do that. So we don't ever say, I can't. We just 
try, we get right in there, we start doing it, right? And the Lord gives us the strength to do that. So I'm, we're, I want to end by talking about this, and then I'm going to need two more volunteers, and everybody who has paper and scissors is going to help with this one. So I actually want you to turn into the Bible to this scripture because it's important. 1 Corinthians 3.10. 1 Corinthians 3.10. And this is for those of us who say, I can't, I can't do it. It won't happen like it's supposed to for me because I'm just lacking. I agree, you're lacking, you can't. But with the Lord Jesus, he can. This is the point, he can. All right, everyone looking at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. And I want you to look at it because I'm going to read it through and I'm going to read it wrong. So you catch me in my mistake, okay? You tell me what I have read wrong. 1 Corinthians 3.10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed with what he buildeth thereupon. Yeah, I changed the word how to with what. Let me read that again. But let every man take heed... With what he builds? Nope. nope. Let every man take heed how he builds. How he builds. We're supposed to be careful how we build our life, not with what we build our life. What does that mean for us? What does that mean for us? It's not about what we have to offer the Lord. It's not about the what we're building with. Whatever we have, whatever he's made you into, whatever resources you have, whatever talents he's given you, you just give it to the Lord. You don't have to worry that you're not a Brother John or a Pastor Readout or you're not a Sister Doris teaching Bible studies. I don't have the ability like Sister Renee to lead songs. I don't have this. I don't have that talent. I can't. I can't. I can't. But you can because whatever the Lord gave you is the materials that you're supposed to build with. It doesn't say with what, it just says how. So you take whatever the Lord has made you into, whatever talents he's given you, even if he's given you no talents, you still take you. You take your five loaves and your two fishes, whatever you have, and you give it to the Lord, and he does the work in you. He just takes whatever you have and makes it into what is needed. We have so many examples of that, like the little boy. He gave what he had, and what did the Lord do? He didn't say, oh, this isn't enough. Let me call out for some extra stuff. He said, I can do whatever with this. This little boy gave me his all. Let me feed the multitude. When he turned water into wine, when Mary finally made him the host of the wedding, when there was a problem, she finally said, okay, Jesus, you're in charge, which he should have been the whole time, right? He's supposed to be in charge the whole time of our lives. What did he do? We have no wine. Okay, I'll send the servants out. We'll go to the stores. Everyone get some more. He took what was right there. He took the foot washing water. He took the jugs that were right there and said, fill these up with water. Here's the miracle. He took what was there. Whatever the resource is needed, he will make from what you give him. Whatever you need to serve him, he will make from whatever you give him, as long as you are giving him your all. Don't just give him your problems. Give him you. Give him your whole life because he makes the impossible possible. So that's what I want to show you with this piece of paper. Does everybody have this piece of paper? Hold this up. Any of my adults doing Kids Talk to? All right, good. I need two, uh, two people who have the paper, one over here and one over here. Kenna, come on up. And anybody on the platform I'm missing? Nope. All right, Keegan, come on up. All right, you're going to stand here and, be, and show people what to do on this side. You're going to stand here and show people what to do on this side, OK? So the impossible task that I am giving you today is to get through this paper. I want you to walk through this paper. Why am I getting these looks? Why am I getting these looks? You think you can't walk through this paper? You think you can't have your body go through this paper? Can your hand go through? So it seems like an impossible task. But with the Lord's how-to plan, take heed how ye build, you're just going to follow the instructions, his how-to instructions with whatever talent you have, with all your cutting talent, you're going to give it to the Lord, and he's going to get you through following his how-to plan. All right, so here's the how-to plan for the impossible paper. 
First, you're going to fold it in half right on this middle line. Right on that middle line, fold it right in half. If anybody last minute wants to try it, there's scissors and papers up here. You can run up and grab one. It's close enough. That's all right. Oh, here. Take this one so you don't have to redo. Paper and scissors, you can join. All right. We got it folded down the middle. Everybody's got theirs in half. Here we go. I'll switch with you. Make it easy. It's hard when you don't have a table to do it on, right? Okay. Now what you're going to do is you're going to take your scissors and you are going to cut only on the dark lines. So start from this end that you folded and just cut up just on the dark lines and stop as soon as you get to the end. One, two, don't snip below, bef, um, beyond that black line. You're just cutting on the black line all the way up. This is the how-to plan. This is God giving us instructions an object lesson to remind us God tells us what to do. We do it. The impossible becomes possible. So we're just cutting up the bottom, just on those lines, right from the fold, and then we're stopping. We're not going all the way. All right? So hold it up when you got it. When you got the bottom, I'll cut. Good job, Kenna. Good job, Keegan. Keep it going. And then hold it up so I know we can move to the next instructions. God gives us instructions. So remember 1 Corinthians didn't say with what. We don't have to be careful with what we build. We just give him our all. We follow his how-to plan. And the how-to plan right now is just cutting on that line. All right. Now the next thing you're going to do is turn it around. So the open side and cut from the bottom up to that line. So from the bottom up, don't cut all the way. You got to stop right at that line. From the bottom all the way up. All right, and hold this up when you have it. We're following God's how-to plan. This is an object lesson to remind us if we follow his plan, the impossible becomes possible. All right. Now, we still can't get through because we have to follow all of God's instructions. We can't just pick and choose which instructions we want to follow. All right? It does, it does kind of look like stairs. All right, I'm going to give you this so you'll be done. So you can do the last step with me, okay? All right, you're doing so diligent up here. Okay, now what you're going to do is you're going to open it up. And you can see that the one on the top has no black line. Don't cut that. Only cut where you see the black line. So right in the middle, there's a black line. Cut. Right on that fold, there's a black line. Cut that black line. Right on your fold, and you should have two folds that have no black line. All right, my helper's up here almost done. How brave I am letting you cut near my fingers. Because you're a good cutter. Got it? Good. All right, that's it. Now hold this. Keegan's right there. He's on his last one. Yep, and holding two things in the air. It's not as easy to cut in the air as you think. There you go. There you go. Okay, now everybody, hold up your paper. Can you get through? I can get through. Let's get through. Let's get through that piece of paper. Go ahead, right over your head, right down over, right through. Ah. <laughs> and Sister Debbie shows how we don't fall into <laughs> Look, I got all the way through. Even me, an adult, got all the way through. I didn't see you adults standing up. You get in the pews. You didn't get all the way through. Stand up and get all the way through. <laughs> Here, Zane, come get all the way through. <laughs> did you get all the way through, Sid? Haley, did you get all the way through? Go all the way through. Ah, <laughs> but carefully so you don't break it. All right, so what is our object lesson? What are we to give the Lord? everything. We just give him all that we have. And what does he do? He makes the impossible, get through this piece of paper, possible. Because he takes what we have, like our loaves and fishes, whatever we give him, we just follow his how-to plan, and you can do it. You can serve the Lord. You can be what he wants you to be because of his power. His how-to plan has the answers for everything we need. We need joy. We need peace. 
We need to know what to do. We seek him, and he gives us the power to do whatever it is he wants accomplished in our life. Thank you, Jesus. Aren't you thankful for that? You can take that back to your seat. You can take that back to your seat. Thank you. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful? Mm -hmm. Let's stand to our feet, and we're going to sing that song one more time. But I want you to think about why we need to be giving him praise. It's a kid's song, but it's about giving him praise, right? How's the song start, Deb? Help me, I'm blanking. There we go. Let us come together, praise the name of Jesus. All the people of the earth come and see. Let us come together, praise the name of Jesus. All the people of the earth come and hear. For joy is like the sun shines. You need joy raining down upon us. Joy is like the golden crown. So let us come together, praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. I give you praise. I give you praise, Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. Brother Phil, the reason we wouldn't fit through that is because we have broad shoulders. It's, that's the only reason we, we might have issue getting through those. So uh, We'll just leave it at that. So thank you, Sister Lisa. Praise the Lord, everybody. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, if this would work for me, that would be fantastic. So today... This morning, we will be turning to the book of John, reading out of chapter 11. And because I am nice to you, we will only read verses 21 through 28. You know, the gospel according to John is my favorite book. And so if it were up to me, we would start with chapter 1, verse 1, and work our way here to really lay the groundwork. But uh, we won't, and instead... I'll just read from chapter 11, verse 21 through 28. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus said unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come. And calleth for thee. Brother Pulford, will you pray God's blessing on us this morning, please? Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. We just read a small section of the text I wanted to read today. Like I said, I wanted to read the, at least the entire 11th chapter and, and parts of the 12th. So instead of reading it, I'm just going to give you a talk through. And uh, so keep your Bibles and your Bible apps open as we go through, because we'll be referencing the, the chapter. Uh, it may be a little bit dry at first, but I think you'll like what the Holy Spirit, uh, where it ends up taking us. So we start this chapter, the Lord is with his disciples out beyond the Jordan, which is where John the Baptist had started. Uh, baptizing people, and they're there because the Jews had gotten mad at him, and first they tried to stone him, and then they tried to capture him, and so because it wasn't time for him to lay down his life, he went out to the wilderness beyond Jordan, and he gets word from Bethany that Lazarus, who was the brother of Mary and Martha, that Lazarus was ill, and we are told that the Lord loved Lazarus, Lazarus Mary, and Martha. 
it's Jesus of Nazareth, and this guy's name is Lazarus. You know, I'm going to call him Lazarus half the time, and every once in a while I'll say Jesus of Nazareth. I can't help it. I've got a short circuit in my brain, and that's how it, how it goes. But we're told that he loves Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And you might think, whoop de doo he loves everybody. For God so loved the world, you know, etc. But it's interesting to note that in the flesh, he did have people who he was closer to than others. Part of this, I'm going to position, and this doesn't really matter, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. Part of the reason he was so close with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus is because they received him. Because they spent the time with him. Because they had him come to their house. And, you know, as we remember the story, Mary would sit at his feet and Martha would serve them. And, and so part of the reason that he loved Lazarus, Mary, and Martha was because they opened themselves up to a relationship that most people didn't have with the Lord. And so the Lord and his disciples hear that Lazarus is ill, and in verse 4, the word tells us that when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death. And we might kind of chuckle because we read the story, and we would think, hey, he, he dies. But he says, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, right away, we see that the whole purpose for this event, well, let me rephrase that. We see that there is a purpose for this event. Lazarus did not just get sick because he ate some bad chicken. He didn't get sick because the, the we're not going to go into that. Uh, he did not get sick for no reason. There was a purpose for his being sick. There's a purpose for him dying of this illness. And that purpose is for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified through it. Right away, we need to consider just how the Son of God being glorified could possibly be for the glory of God. Reflected glory is a myth. I've never once complimented somebody to somebody else and that person felt as though I was complimenting them. I mean, you can tell me how great my kids are and I will agree 100% and I'll be proud of them getting a little bit of praise, but I'm not going to walk around thinking I'm God's great gift to this world because my sons did something really nice, right? Right? Right away, we need to consider how this Son of God being glorified brings glory to God. And we'll see this terminology used throughout the New Testament. None of his messengers throughout the scripture ever accepted glory or praise from people. Anytime you see uh, a messenger coming and the messengee, the recipient of the message, seeing the angel and seeing the the, the scary splendor of the angel and revelation is a, a good indication of this right john who knew better kept falling down and worshiping at the feet of the angel and they kept saying don't do that i'm just a co-worker i i don't deserve the glory i don't deserve don't do that but if glory could be reflected to the creator or to another person then they could have received that glory with the understanding that it was really just praising God through praising them. But instead, we see over and over again them telling them, don't glorify me, don't worship me, I'm just a messenger. Reflected glory is a myth. Glorifying the Son of God is glorifying God because the Son of God is the fleshly revelation of God. He is God himself manifested in the flesh. That's why, they call, that's why he's called the son of God because he is the flesh that God became. So when you glorify the flesh that God became, he's fully God. You are glorifying God. I will say the opposite is true. When you glorify uh, the great transcendence deity, you are glorifying the manifestation that he became. 
You can't understand him. You can't know him except through the manifestation. So glorifying God through the Son of God is because they are the same person. I think I got two yeses on that one. I know you agree, though. After considering this glory of God through the Son of God, we recognize that the Lord is telling us again that this illness is designed to result in glorifying God's manifestation, the Lord Jesus Christ. We also see that the end result of this sickness is not death. See, we read this is not unto death, and we think, oh yeah, it is. But it really wasn't because Lazarus didn't stay dead. So yeah, it, there was a time in the middle where it got kind of rough for him. And then it got better. And then the Lord resurrected him and it became rough again. You know, because he was pulled out of the, the reward he would have had. But, so we see that the end, of this, the end result of this sickness is not death. And in this world, we view death as the end. And, and so uh, we, when we see this, we think, oh, the Lord is saying, don't worry. It's not going to kill him. But that's not what the Lord said. He said, the end result isn't death. He'll be sick and he'll die, but then he'll be alive again. And the reason he'll be alive again is because the, the Son of God is going to be glorified. There's going to be an event which will bring glory to the Son of God, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, in fact, without, you know, so he says this sickness is not unto death. And just a few verses later, he's talking about Lazarus is asleep. Let's go wake him up. And they're like, oh, good, he's only asleep. He'll be fine. And he's like, no, you idiot. Lazarus is dead. He didn't say idiot because he was more gen he was gentle and I'm not. But he says Lazarus is dead. He says it very plainly immediately after saying that this sickness was not going to be unto death. So the Lord knew that the sickness was going to kill Lazarus, but he also knew that he was not going to let death be permanent, and so he refers to it as being asleep. He, he similarly refers to Jairus' daughter as being asleep, even though she had been dead for a little while. And as he had done at the very beginning of this chapter, he lets them know that there is a purpose for this event. In verse 15, he tells them, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that ye may believe, or to the intent ye may believe. I'm glad I wasn't there, because if I was there, I probably wouldn't have, uh, I would have been tempted to heal him. I would have been tempted to intervene a little bit earlier. But my intent here is that you would believe. And so he says, if I were there, you would not have gotten the full benefit of what I intend to do. But what I'm about to do in this circumstance will reveal me to you. You will see me more clearly, and you will learn to believe in me more fully. Amen. How is God glorified by the disciples believing on him? Because by believing on him, believing on him is, is seeing him for who he is and what he is, and then placing yourself in proper relationship. It's acting according to your revelation of him, right? Faith is your knowledge of God that enables you to act, and acting uh, combine, perfects and completes your faith, which is believing. And so God is saying, there's a purpose here, and when you believe in me, I will be glorified in your life. Yeah. You cannot know him, and you cannot understand who he is without giving him glory and honor. You can reject him, but if you place him where he belongs in your life, that is uh, inevitably glorifying the Lord. And so the Lord waits two days after hearing this news, and, and only after two days that you know, passed, he said, all right, I'm going to head on over and wake him up. And the disciples decide that he may have forgotten that the reason he was beyond Jordan was because the Jews were trying to kill him. And so like, are you crazy? You know they just tried to stone you, right? And so what he tells them, uh, it's an interesting section, we'll talk about it some other time because it's great, but... He says, you know, there's 12 hours in the day. And, you know, if any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of the world. And, but if he walks in the night, part of what he is saying here is, I know the plan. I know what I'm going to do. 
My plan is to be glorified in this event. I'm not going to be gypped out of my plan because somebody's going to hit me with a rock. Right? He's walking in the day. He knows where the path is. He knows where he's going. He's not stumbling around trying to figure out what tomorrow will bring. This is a part of his plan. And so Thomas, you know, we love Thomas, and he decides that if the Lord is going to go back to Judea to die, then he might as well go with them and be killed too. And this is pretty ironic because there's already a dead person in this story, Lazarus. And Thomas expects that this little adventure will result in another dead person, the Lord. And so he says, if the Lord's going to die, then I might as well die too, and then all you other disciples should come along and you can die too. So at the, Thomas is expecting, at the minimum, three dead people in this little adventure. Possibly more. And yet, when we reach the end of this narrative, there's not a single dead person. Hallelujah. So that's kind of, that's kind of ironic and, and interesting as we see. We come up with all kinds of reasons why it's doom and gloom, forgetting that God's got it figured out. and not, He didn't just have it figured out. He planned it out. So yeah, so we're kind of afraid, but he's not scrambling back. He's not NASA with Houston, we have a problem. He knows they got a problem. He put the problem there so that the solution could bring glory to him. So we get all stressed and we think gloom and doom. You think God doesn't know? He told Peter how he was going to die long before Peter died. I, I don't want to know that, Lord. But Peter had a chance every day of his life to decide, I'm sticking with the plan that my Savior gave me. I'm going to do what my master told me to do, even though I know what the end result will be. Because he is my master, and this is his plan. And his plan is far better than any plan I can come up with. And I think I can plan pretty good about being on a beach in Tahiti, you know, I, nobody else around, just, just me and, and cold beverages and, and the beautiful sea, and of course my family on a slightly separated part so I can get a little bit of peace and quiet. Uh, you know, we'll have dinner together and spend some time together, but eventually there's got to be just a beach and me, right? I'd be miserable because God knows what I have need of, and he knows what his plan is for me. And sadly enough, it does not involve being on a beach in Tahiti all by myself enjoying peace and quiet. But it's better. And at the end, I will look back and I will say, thank you, Lord, for not letting me do what I wanted, but for placing the perfect plan for me. And so they go on to Bethany, and, and by this time, Lazarus was dead and gone, and in, in that culture, the dead were buried within 24 hours of, of death. And, and we are told that Lazarus had lain, in the grave, had lain in the grave for four days already. Lazarus had died and been buried. The grave had been sealed. They had hired professional mourners to come and weep and wail when they were too tired to. They had time for people from Jerusalem, which was not that far away, to come on over and to sit with Mary and Martha. They were well into this mourning process by the time the Lord shows up. And obviously they're a pretty prominent family based on the uh, people coming from Jerusalem to, to sit with them. And so Martha, you know, the Lord comes and finds, and, and yes, he's been dead for four days, buried for four days. And Martha hears that the Lord is coming and she goes out to meet him. And, you know, that's always a good message in and of itself, right? Don't sit at home waiting for the Lord to show up. Go out and meet him. It falls apart when you realize that he's everywhere anyway, so, you know, for us it doesn't quite work, but you can get a good pep talk out of that, right? Yeah, go, go get him. And, uh, but Mary stays at home, and, and we're not sure if Mary knew if the Lord was on his way or not. It, it doesn't say, but we do know that Martha runs out, and the first thing she says to him that's recorded is, Lord, if, you would, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. Lord, if only you were here when he was sick, Lazarus wouldn't be dead. We wouldn't be buried. He wouldn't have been buried, and we wouldn't have been so miserable. If only you were here. And so many times in our, our trials and in our little scare moments, we think, oh, God, if only you were here. If only you were here, this wouldn't get this bad. And he's already here. He's already under control. Whatever happens in your life, is not because God didn't show up on time. 
God shows up exactly on time. He was already there. I'm going to keep throwing that out there because we like to anthropomorphize God and we forget that, no, he's, he's here. He's already here. And so, uh, Lord, if only you'd been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And, and this is a sentiment shared by, shared by the other Jews, right? We'll read later on. They're like, if this guy could have opened blind eyes, couldn't he have stopped Lazarus from dying of his sickness? And, and the answer is, yeah, he, he could have. And, but Martha continues, and, and we'll look, jump to verse 22. He says, but I know even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it of thee. Or God will give it thee. And she no doubt thought she was making a bold proclamation of faith. You know, even now, he's dead and buried. We've been mourning him for days, but I know if you ask God, he can, he'll give it to you. Martha clearly wants the Lord to ask God for something. And she is confident that God will do it. And this does highlight in my mind that Martha did not know the Lord Jesus Christ like the centurion did in Matthew 8, verse 8. That centurion told the Lord, look, I, I, Lord, I understand how authority works. And you have the authority to simply say the word, and that creative word will force your will to be done. Simply by saying it makes it happen. You have all authority. If you want it done, it will be done. You don't have to do it. You just have to want it to be done, and it will be done. Uh, he says, you know, just say the word, and my daughter will be healed. Uh, if you say it, Lord, it cannot do anything but be exactly as you said it. So Martha was operating under this idea that uh, the Lord was doing miracles by asking God. What, like me, Lord, please heal this person so I don't look like a, an idiot, you know, trying to pray for somebody and nothing happened. But, uh, but that's not how it worked. And so uh, Martha did not understand who Jesus Christ was. She had a pretty good understanding, but she didn't have a complete understanding. And an incomplete understanding is a misunderstanding. Like the Lord said, my father works hitherto. And I work. To believe that the Lord was just asking God for favors along the way is to completely misunderstand who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And the Lord doesn't tell her that he would ask for anything. He just tells her, your brother shall rise again. And the word shall is stronger than it is today, but it indicates that it is a requirement, that it is more than just a statement of fact. It is a promise or and a command. Shall means not only it's a fact, but there's no other way for it to be. Martha believes that the Lord is just trying to comfort her like we all do. Oh, we'll see him again in heaven. But not beside the eastern gates over there, you know. Uh, but that's not what the Lord was saying. And so she responds and says, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So clearly she's not a Sadducee because they didn't believe in the resurrection. And she knows that the dead will rise to stand before the Lord in the judgment. But the Lord was not talking about one of these days far in the future. In the last day, Lazarus is going to rise. He says, your brother will rise again, shall rise again. And so she says, yeah, I know eventually. Uh, but remember that this entire event is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ by causing other people to recognize that he is both Lord and Christ. He is both Almighty God and he is our salvation. And to recognize that and to respond accordingly. And the Lord Jesus Christ tells Martha, and, and, and thus he tells us, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then he asks her, do you believe this? He is the resurrection and the life. And whosoever believeth in him will live even if they died. 
But if they live and believe on him, they shall never, ever die. Now, some of you may be thinking, wait, what? I know a couple of people who, who believed on him and, and they're dead. I knew people who knew that Jesus Christ was the one true living God manifested in the flesh, and, and they believed that, and they lived it, and, and they lived their lives in service, and they're dead. Well, that's when he's talking about there is coming a resurrection, right? Death, even for us, is only temporary. That's true for everybody. It's not just if you're a good person, death is only temporary. You're going to die unless he comes before then. But you are going to be raised back. And you will either be raised up into glory or you'll be raised up into judgment. But the Lord here is talking about that resurrection in the latter days. And, and uh, so we, we think about this, and, and he's, he's going back to what he had answered her, right? I am the resurrection and the life. There is coming a day when everybody will be resurrected. Why? Because I said so, and I am the resurrection, and I am the life. One day, the dead will rise in the last day. And do you believe that? And Mary says, yeah. I mean, so what we think about it, as we look at this, she had just asked the Lord. She just said, God, or she said, Lord, whatever you ask of God, I know he'll give it to you. And so what he's telling her is that I am the resurrection and the life. He's saying, I don't just ask God for this. I am God. I own that. I don't have to ask a third party to raise the dead for me. I am God. I am the resurrection. I am the life. I get to choose who lives and who dies and who lives again and who dies again and who lives again and who dies again. I get to do all of that because I'm God. That's what he's telling her here. And, and so uh, he asks her if he, she believes that he is the resurrection and the life and that whosoever believes in him, though he were dead, yet shall live, and whosoever is alive and believes in him shall never die. And it seems a th ridiculous thing to say to her, except for he's, he's going back to where she said she knew, right? She said, I know he will rise again in the last day. And he's saying, yes. Do you believe that I'm the cause of that final resurrection? The Lord meets you where you are before he gives you the next steps to go on, right? And so he's doing that with her here. And, it, it, and she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And, and she says, yes, she does believe that. And then she, she kind of clarifies it. She says, I believe you are the Messiah. And this is a different, deeper commitment for her saying to the Lord than just believing that he can ask. He's one of God's favorites and God will give him what she wants. He's saying, no, I believe you are the Messiah. And I believe, therefore, that the Messiah is the one who determines life and death, the one who determines resurrection unto eternal life or resurrection unto damnation. And, and so that was sufficient for her at that day because after she says that, she goes on her way and she tells Mary secretly that the Lord had called for her. Now, we aren't told that the Lord had called for Mary. We just have the fact that Martha was telling Mary that the Lord did. But what we see here is that the Lord had, or that Martha had reached that place in her interaction with the Lord, that she was no longer asking him, ask God to raise Lazarus. But she got into the point where she was okay. All right, you're the resurrection. You're the life. You tell me Lazarus is going to rise again, and that's going to have to be good enough for me. And then she calls for Mary, and when Mary meets the Lord, she... And she jumps up and runs to meet him, and she says the exact same thing that Martha said. Why did she say this exact same thing? Because they probably said it to each other over and over and over again throughout Lazarus' sickness, throughout his dying, throughout his burial, and throughout the past couple of days of mourning. And so, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. It's the same exact thing. And, and clearly they had been depending on the hope that the Lord would show up in time to keep him from dying. And so, while Martha seems to be satisfied, Mary is still a little bit 
uncertain. But the Lord doesn't, we're not told anything that the Lord says to Mary. They just go to uh, where the tomb was. And, and the Lord tells them to roll away the stone. And, and Martha, who just said, I believe you are the resurrection and the life. I believe that you are the Messiah, which is to come into the world, says, Lord, you don't want to roll that stone away because by now he stinks. Body had been in the tomb for four days, and back then they didn't embalm bodies. And so the tomb was sealed with the large rock to keep the stench inside. Bodies don't smell very good once they start to die. Lord, that body is rotten. You do not want to smell that. And the Lord tells her, in response, the Lord tells her, didn't I tell you if you would believe that you would see the glory of God? Now, we don't read where he said that specifically to her, uh, but the scripture doesn't document everything he ever said. He, uh, John says if, if we were to, there's not enough books in the world to contain it. Uh, but uh, even rejecting the assumption that there was a conversation that wasn't documented, we can look at what the Lord had told her, and we can see how he did tell her that if she would believe, she would see the glory of God. He told her, your brother shall rise again. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this. He told Martha that he was the source of all life. And that he is the resurrection. Uh, and that would resurrect her brother. He also let her know that if she believed in him, she would never die. That's a something that if you believe that, you're going to have to admit that person is God. And he also, uh, so experiencing the power of his resurrection personally is going to cause you to glorify him. There's coming a day where every knee will bow and every tongue confess. There's coming a day when, when even the most anti-Christian person out there is going to kneel at his feet and worship him as king of kings. There's going to be a time where even the most debased uh, person on earth is going to stand before that white throne of judgment and acknowledge that he is the just judge of the whole earth, that his, his judgments are truth. And so experiencing the power of this resurrection, experiencing this will cause him to be glorified and giving him the result for which he laid down his life, which is allowing him to become your Lord and your Savior. Doing that glorifies the Lord because it puts you in proper relationship with him. He's saying, if you believe on me, you're going to glorify me, but you're also going to see the power of God. You're going to see my glory. You're not just going to see a man who can ask God for favors and God will do it. You're going to see that I am God manifested in the flesh. And if you see that and if you follow along, one of these days you're going to watch me as I ascend into heaven in a glorified body. You're going to see the glory of God, all right. And then one day, long after you're dead and gone, you're going to see the glory of God because I will come again and I will bring you to be with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. She's going to see the glory of God repeatedly through her life if she will only believe that he is who he says he is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Additionally, as we have mentioned and seen repeatedly, the entire purpose of Lazarus' sickness and death was to bring glory to God. The people obey him and they roll away the stone from the tomb. Uh, and as the scripture says, the place where the dead was laid. The scripture reminds us repeatedly that Lazarus was not sleeping. You know, the Lord raised three people from the dead that is documented. Two of those were done pretty quickly after those two individuals died. And they had an audience, but it wasn't a huge audience. God waited until Lazarus was good and truly dead. When there was no doubt. When you could tell by the smell alone that there was nothing living in that tomb. And so the scripture keeps re-emphasizing the, the reality that Lazarus was D-E-A-D, dead. 
He was stone cold dead. He was rotting corpse dead, beyond all hope dead. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. And this entire ordeal is designed and inevitably will bring glory to him. And he emphasizes this because he prays in a loud voice so that everybody can hear him. Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I know that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. What's he doing? He's saying, I'm not just Messiah, I am God. I'm letting you know that there's not just a connection here, but I am on a, not like, not like the Blues Brothers mission from God, but, uh, you know, I am the plan of God being implemented. I am the action and the power of God. I am the word that, that went forth and will not return void. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so he says, I prayed this so that people would believe that you have sent me. And again, believing that the Lord Jesus Christ is the one true living God manifest in the flesh, that he is the right hand of God, that is glorifying the Lord. It is recognizing him for who and what he is. And, that, and if you accept that, you will inevitably, you, you must, by accepting that, place yourself in proper relationship to him. And this is why over and over again in this narrative, we are told why this is happening that the Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified and that they will believe in him because it's the same thing. You can't believe in him and not glorify him. And you can't glorify him if you don't believe in him. It's almost as though he's saying, hey, everybody, you need to understand that God is at work here. All things are according to purpose and for his glory. See, you cannot follow God because he is good to you. You cannot follow him because he feeds you or entertains you. You can't follow him because you believe he's a really, really good guy with really good ideas. You must follow him because he is the almighty God. He is the Alpha and Omega. You must follow him because you owe him service as uh, as your God. Until you understand that he is the only God, he cannot become your salvation. If he is a God, he is not your salvation. It is not until he becomes your God, the host in your life, the only God that you serve, that he becomes your salvation. And the one true living God made flesh stood before that tomb filled with a stench of rotting flesh and in a loud voice cries out, Lazarus, come forth. And the scripture says literally, And came forth he who had been dead. So the emphasis here in the Greek is different than it is in the English. The English says, uh, where was it? I just lost it. Talks about the guy who was dead came forth. Right? But the emphasis is not on the guy who's dead. And he that was dead came forth. Right? So the emphasis in this sentence is on he that was dead. He just happened to come forth. In the Greek, it says, came forth, he who was dead. The emphasis is not on the fact that Lazarus was dead. The emphasis is is not on the fact that he's now alive. The emphasis is that the Lord said, come forth, and come forth is what Lazarus did. (laughs) Hallelujah. The details are unimportant. God said it. It's going to be done exactly how he said it. He said, let there be light. And there was light. Light shone through the shroud that that enveloped the earth. He said, peace, be still. And it was peaceful. And it was still. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And come forth, did Lazarus. The emphasis is on the fact that what the Lord says is exactly what happens. He doesn't say something and get a good enough response. What he says is inevitably exactly what he said would happen. The fact that it was Lazarus who was dead for him was no more difficult than it being a bird laying an egg or a fig tree withering up or or a, a fish having a tax payment in its mouth. None of that is difficult for God. Raising the dead, it doesn't even matter. Oh yeah, you made the stars too. The details are unimportant. What's important is that the authority said this happened and that happened. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. I get excited about that. I don't know if you can tell that. Um, uh, you probably can't tell that I'm, I'm yelling out, out here, but I'm, I'm really, hallelujah. And came forth he who had been dead. Uh, and I, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, and when I was talking about uh, he was the light, right? Uh, the Lord commanded be, and so is, and since we're in, now we're in the future from it, was, right? And, and how, how clearly the simplicity of the awesome power of God is exhibited. He didn't have to figure out how to make physics. He didn't have to figure out how to make a ball of, of, of gases you know, combust and burn for millennia. He just said, be. And whatever he said would be, was. That's power. I try to tell somebody to do something, and I got to sit down and diagram it for them. And then I got to go get them the supplies to do it. And then I got to hold their hand while they do it. And then I got to push them to the side so I can do it. <laughs> and then I got to tear it down and do it right the second time because now I figured out what I did wrong the first time. But God doesn't deal with any of that stuff. Just he's, he is the authority. He says this. And there's no alternative but for that. So when he says, no man shall pluck you out of my hand, there's no chance anybody's going to pluck you out of his hand. When he says, uh, the son and whosoever shall be free is free indeed. That's absolute. You are indeed free. If the son has set you free, there's no bonds on you. You are free. If you decide to hold on to something and pretend you're in bondage, then fine. But there's no bonds on you because the son has set you free. You understand the, the immensity of the authority and the power that's demonstrated by the fact that the creative word creates. He, he didn't have to develop the universe. He just said, let there be. And it was. And it was inevitably what the Lord said it should be. Hallelujah. That, that's, a, that's awesome. I'll say it myself because I didn't just come up with that on my own. Whenever the Lord says something, anything, whenever he commands, there is no possibility of anything other than what he has commanded. The Lord calls out Lazarus to come forth. It's important that he said who he was calling to because otherwise every dead person on earth even those who had disintegrated past beyond bones would have been trying to crawl forth. And nobody wants to see that. That'd be creepy. They make movies out of that kind of thing. But so he, he highlights the individual he wants to, call, to come forth. Otherwise, everybody would have come forth. And, and it's Lazarus. And, and Lazarus is dead. And he's decomposing. And he's wrapped up in these things. And he's got a cloth over his face. And he's in a cave with a rock, you know. But that one call... The Lord didn't say, come back alive. Right? He didn't say, by the powers invested in me, by the Almighty God, return to life. He said, Lazarus, come forth. You know what Lazarus needed in order to come forth? He had to be alive. And he was going to obey God because when God commands... It happens. God didn't waste time giving two commands. Lazarus, wake up. Now come on out here. Right? The assumption being made is, I want you out here. So therefore, you're going to be alive and out here. I don't know if you're catching this picture. and I'm going to stop harping on it shortly. But there's such immensity of authority an immensity of power in demonstration. And we disbelieve God when we ask for something that he's told us he wants. When we're fighting a sin that he broke the bondage for, and we say, Lord, if you would just 
deliver me from that. He already has. If we would just believe the immensity of his power that would apply to us and we could walk in his power, how our lives would change. Hallelujah. The centurion said, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. God's word is inevitable. So when he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you come to him, it's inevitable he will give you rest. Come unto him, and he will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. I promise you, if you come unto him, and if you learn of him, you're going to find rest for your soul. If you don't have rest for your soul, it's not because he isn't doing it. It's because you haven't learned enough about him. It's because you haven't come to him in the proper position, the proper place. If you don't get the result of the promise, it's not because the promiser broke the promise. His words are yea and amen. His word is settled in heaven. There is no variance. So if you don't have rest for your soul, that's a pretty good indication. You need to learn more about God. If you do what he says, you will get the result that he said you will get. I'm going to wait till there's a little more acceptance here. You know, it's a, if you do what he says, you will inevitably receive what he says he will do. That also means if you don't do what he tells you to do, you will inevitably receive what he said will happen if you don't do what he's told you to do. It's not just a promise. It's a reality. And it can be good or it can be bad. And so the Lord says, Lazarus, come forth. And the Greek very simply demonstrates that the result of his statement is immediately and exactly fulfilled. And came forth he who had been dead. Lazarus was dead. But the resurrection and the life restored his life. Resurrected his body. You know, all the decaying stuff. Stopped decaying and was reformed. We don't want to get into too much detail as to what dissolves first and where the blood pools and, and all that kind of fun stuff. But the entire death process was reversed immediately. And he came forth no longer dead, but renewed and resurrected in life. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 The result of this was exactly what the Lord said it was going to be. And no, I'm not talking about your brother shall rise again, although that was exactly what happened. But it's that the scripture tells us that many of the Jews who came to see Mary saw the things that Jesus did and believed on him. If you believe on him, you're glorifying him. There's that immediate fulfillment of the purpose of this whole event but that glorification that he uh, received from followers believing on him that he was uh, God manifest that was only a portion of the fulfillment the scripture tells us that in contrast to those who believed that some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done and as a result from that time forward the Pharisees started working to put him to death in fact, Caiaphas, the high priest, unwittingly prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. The Lord was glorified in the, in the lives of those who believed on him as a result of him raising Lazarus from the dead, but he would go on to an even greater glorification. He is the resurrection and the life. He wasn't just one who resurrected. 
He is the resurrection and the life. We know that prophecies in Scripture typically have an immediate application, at least one fulfillment in the intermediary, in the intermediate future, and a final fulfillment at, at, at the end, at an even later time period. Joel's first prophecy is an, is an excellent example of this. You know, the locusts have eaten everything. The locusts are almost here, and they're going to eat everything. And that one day, the locusts are going to come and eat everything. You know, the, the three phases of a prophetic fulfillment. And the Lord's statement that the Son of God would be glorified in this event was immediately fulfilled. But in his fulfillment of the office of the Son, he has a far greater and everlasting fulfillment of this prophecy. <laughs> Additionally, the Lord's statement that he is the resurrection and the life is a statement of fact, but his declaration, in that, in that declaration, we have a hope of a promise that is implicit within it. If he is the res resurrection and the life, and if whosoever believeth on him, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and whosoever liveth and believeth on him shall never die, that is a promise to you and me that if we believe on him, we, death is temporary, that there is an everlasting life that we will be resurrected into. That, that's, a, that's a promise that we see in his declaration of fact. And he tells the sister of the man who had been dead for four days that he was the resurrection and that he was the life. In John chapter 9, the Lord states, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And he gave sight to a blind man. Where that man had lived in darkness, the Lord gave him the ability to see light and light bouncing off of objects. That's what happens when you see. You're seeing the effect of light. The man lived in darkness, and the Lord literally demonstrated that he was the light by giving that person the ability to see the light. God inserted light into that man's life. Shortly before proclaiming himself to be the bread of life, he took a couple of buns of, of barley uh, and made a whole bunch of bread for everybody else. He proclaims himself to be the, breath of the bread of life just after he fed everybody bread. Just after he talked about uh, being manna from heaven. And, and in this situation, the Lord tells a woman who had been mourning her dead brother for four days, who had already buried her brother for four days, that he is the resurrection and the life. And he proves it in the immediate term by resurrecting Lazarus. It'd be cool to believe that he's a resurrection and the life, but still have to wait until the last days. But God fulfilled that promise immediately. There's a resurrection going to happen right now. Lazarus, come forth. There's an intermediate fulfillment in, in Christ's resurrection. Shortly after this, uh, he is crucified and buried. This is the last big uh, miracle uh, that we read about in John. And, and he's, after this, he's crucified and buried. The Almighty God manifest in the flesh, laid down his life for the sins of the world. And then the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the life and who is the resurrection, resurrected himself. There is only one resurrection, the Lord Jesus Christ. So yeah, the resurrection resurrected the resurrection. Say that four times fast. The resurrection resurrected the life that he laid down. The life he said he would lay down but also said he would take it back up again. This is the intermediate fulfillment, but it is much more than just an intermediate fulfillment of a prophecy. It's so much more than that because it's because of his death, burial, and resurrection that we have the hope of resurrection unto everlasting life. It's fine for him to say, I am the resurrection and the life, but if he didn't apply if he didn't provide a means for us to avail ourselves of him, of his resurrection, then we would, know, we would not have a hope of a resurrection. And, and so the resurrection, uh, it occurs without witnesses. We have no documentation that somebody watched the Lord res, uh, rise from the dead. But we do have several hundred witnesses who watched him, who saw him after the resurrection when he met with them. And there were a whole bunch of people who watched him ascend into heaven in his glorified body. Um, he showed up to show his disciples it worked. My job was done. To sacrifice 
was accepted. The resurrection is available to you. You have hope of life everlasting because I conquered death, hell, and the grave. Just like the high priest would come out of the Holy of Holies and show himself to the children of Israel saying, Hey, you accepted the sacrifice. We're all set. The Lord Jesus Christ reappeared after his resurrection to show himself to his disciples in that same manner. It has been accepted. Your sins can be washed away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because the Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life and took it up again in the resurrection that is of primary importance to us, we can be buried in his name and rise up resurrected into newness of life. Because he is the life, he created all things. The life force of all things generate from him. Being the giver of life, he is also the restorer of life. Death was not a part of his creation. That came as opposition to his creation uh, and the inevitable result of separation from him. But the giver of life, even in death, can give new life. He is the life giver. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized unto his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall walk in newness of life. I'm so thankful for newness of life. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How can we live according to his will? How can we live in Christ? Because he died for us. Because he resurrected from the dead. Because he did that, we can be buried and rise again, living in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, he offers us life in that more abundantly. We mentioned the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel 37 several times now in the past few weeks, but this is another great application. Because he is a resurrection, he could restore those dry bones. He could, those bones were separated. They were not held together by anything. They were just dry bones. There was no tenon. But he can give new life even to the deadest of the dead. He is the resurrection and the life. So there's nothing but proximity to prove that one bone belonged next to the other. But the resurrection can bring new life into them and raise those dry bones into an army poised and ready to perform God's call in their new lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because he is a resurrection, he can restore life to dead marriages. He can restore life to those who feel dead inside. He can resurrect dead uh, relationships. He can resurrect dead dreams. He can resurrect dead-end existences. He can resurrect a meaningless, purposeless existence and bring that into a vibrant, jubilant life. He is the resurrection and the life. If you feel as though you are dead inside, he can resurrect you into fulfillment and purpose. If you feel as though you'd rather be dead than face another day of, of meaningless existence, the Lord Jesus Christ can right now breathe new life into you. He can right now restore you and resurrect you into the relationship with him that you were born for, that he created you to have. Hallelujah. He is the resurrection and the life. If your dreams have died, the Lord can resurrect dreams within you, granting you a life of new vision and new purpose. If your relationship with your spouse or with your children or even with friends feels like it has died and is starting to stink, the Lord Jesus Christ can put new love into your relationships and can resurrect those relationships into a proper status. We've seen marriages get called back from the dead. If you are dead in sin, the Lord Jesus Christ can raise you up into newness of life, into a brand new existence in his righteousness and his holiness. He is the resurrection and the life. Death is not a part of his plan. Cooperate with him and he will restore you to life. 
the resurrection and the life is available to you today. He has been calling for you to reach out and to accept him so that he can bring your life into in, so he can bring life into your existence and deliver you from the bondage of death. Hallelujah. We have the opportunity for the immediate application of that intermediate fulfillment of his promise. We can see that promise delivered to us right now today simply by believing on him. Act according to your knowledge of who he is. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And because the Lord Jesus Christ died, because he was buried, and because he rose again one day in the last day, there will be a resurrection from the resurrection, and all who are dead will be resurrected. I know I said resurrected a lot of times, but because he died, buried, and resurrected, everything will one day be resurrected. See, if the Lord Jesus Christ had not resurrected himself, the, there would only be one resurrection in the last day, and that would be all people standing before the white throne of judgment and being cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20 tells us that that is the second death. If the Lord Jesus Christ was not the life, we all would experience the second death. This is the inevitable result of our efforts to separate ourselves from God and serve our own desires. This is the inevitable fate to which all humanity was reserved. But God, who is... Hallelujah. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. That was Ephesians 2, if you didn't recognize their reference. We all would have been resurrected only into the second death, but God is rich in mercy that he has great love that he's given to us. And so even when we were dead in sin, he's quickened us together with Christ. That means he gave us life. That's what quickening means. He resurrected us. He gave us new life uh, together with Christ. And through his grace, we are saved. Hallelujah. Because the Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life to pay the price for the sins of the world, we do not have to suffer that fate. Because he died, buried, and was resurrected, we do not have to stand before the white throne of judgment and be cast into the lake of fire. We do not have to suffer that because he is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the resurrection. He is the life. Through his life, we have an opportunity for life everlasting as opposed to uh, the second death. Hallelujah. Yeah, I know we deserve damnation. I know we don't deserve his grace, but that is the wonder of his love, that he stands calling to us, eager to, to have us, wanting to resurrect us into new life. That's his desires, that we can walk with him free of sin and free of death into life everlasting. It is his plan, the whole purpose of his glorification, that one day we will be raised up into everlasting life. So we can dwell with him and we can value him and we can thank him for his grace to us. John chapter 5, 28 and 29 tells us that we will inevitably reap what we've sown. He says, and uh, marvel not at this for the hour is coming and the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I'm so glad that he resurrected himself so that we could have resurrection into life everlasting. I am so grateful for that opportunity to be resurrected unto life. The entirety of scripture tells us, as does our own hearts and intellect, that we have sown the seeds of our own destruction. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. And his purpose is that none should perish, but all should have everlasting life. That is his desire. He has made it available for you today. 
We can reap what we have sown or we can reap the reward of his sacrifice and be raised into the resurrection of life. Let's praise him for the opportunity to benefit. Let's praise him for his sacrifice. Hallelujah. Let's worship him for being our propitiation, for being our life and the resurrection. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord Jesus was glorified in the hearts and the minds of some of those who saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. But it was upon his death, burial, and resurrection that the Lord Jesus Christ truly became glorified. When he fulfilled the office of the Son and ascended into heaven, highly exalted and given a name above every name, then the Lord Jesus Christ began to be truly glorified. When his purpose from before creation could be fully realized and his people called by his name could see him as the one true living God and could say, he is my God. He also is become my salvation. That is when the Lord Jesus Christ begins to be truly glorified in our lives. His purpose was a relationship with creation that could value him for who and what he is. And in his death, burial, and resurrection, he made that a possibility for whosoever will. Whosoever will. His resurrection from his own death proved that he is the almighty God incarnate. We've been going through that several times uh, in, in, the, in the book of Acts. And, uh, but it proves that he is the almighty God incarnate. Uh, his resurrection broke all the bonds of sin and death. And that's why Isaiah could write in 25, 8, He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. Hallelujah. The Lord hath spoken it. He swallowed up death in victory. And he will wipe away all tears from the eyes. He will take away the rebuke of his people. Because he died, buried, and resurrected, we have that hope and that promise. His resurrection offers us the chance of life everlasting so that one day we can proclaim to all creation, Lo, this is our God. I cannot wait to show him off to the universe. To say this is the God who's rich in mercy. This is the God who is everlasting long suffering. This is the God who has saved me from the uttermost. This is the God who had a plan for me that I would not be cast into the lake of fire. This is the God who had worked everything out so I could be raised up into newness of life. Look at this God. He's not just absolute holy. He's absolute good. He's absolute love. He's absolute mercy. Look at this God who has saved us from the uttermost. Look at him. Glorify him. He is worthy of all praise. Hallelujah. I, I can't handle this. Look at our God. Don't look at the mess here. Look at our God. Look at the one who delivers. Look at the one who saves. Look at the one who is our life. Look at the one who is our resurrection. Look at the new life we have right now. Look at the new people we are right now. But one day, even this is going to be inconsequential because we will be glorified. We'll be like him and we can live with him face to face. Look at a God who is everything. Look at the God who is omnipotent, who is omniscient, who is all power, all holiness. And he makes a place for us to dwell with him. Look at that God. Hallelujah. 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 Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. I'm telling you tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be glorified. 
the purpose of creation is glorifying God. One day you will glorify him whether you want to or not. But I want you to look at the God who gave us a way out of damnation. I want you to behold the God who paid the price for your sins so that you don't have to. I want you to look at the God who every day of your life is reaching out for you saying, come closer to me. Take my yoke upon you. I don't want you to be miserable. I don't want you to be hurting and alone. I don't want you to be stuck in bondage of sin. I broke those bonds. I want you to be with me. I want you to have my life and that more abundantly. Look at our God. We have waited for him. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. Oh, but one day. I am glad and I rejoice in my salvation right now. But one day. Losing my voice isn't going to matter. One day the inability to express inner emotion isn't going to matter. One day there is a fullness of joy. There will be rejoicing beyond comprehension when we can bask in his salvation for eternity. Praise the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ is the resurrection and he is the life. Take his resurrection upon you today. Take his life upon you today. Allow him to breathe new life into your walk with him. Allow him to, to work within you and restore you to what he has intended you to be from the very beginning. Look at the God who is so merciful and so loving. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to open up the altars right now. This is, this is a good time to worship him. This is a good time to look at him and see him as he truly is the God of love, the God of mercy, the resurrection, and the life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's stand if you're seated, please. Let's stand together. The pastor has asked me to pray the closing prayer of this service. I told him that's dangerous because I haven't been preaching for a while. And uh, that's both by some necessity and some choice. Uh, I do have a lot of things that are churning inside. Thankful that the Lord hasn't set me on the shelf and then gone somewhere else, but He's sitting on the shelf with me and talking to me. I really appreciate and hope that you do that the excitement of the preacher was not a technique. I know preachers who do that as a technique. I've never, well, there may have been a few times early in my ministry when I did it as a technique. I thank God for delivering me from that sin and letting the excitement come from the message the Lord put in the heart and expressing to you how important it is. Did you take a moment there and think of what it's going to be like when we behold him as he is? Ma. The infinite God the transcendent God made manifest and we will see him as he is. I want to tell you before I pray, whatever the crisis that exists in your life may be, whatever the condition that you are convinced has overwhelmed your soul, the Lord Jesus Christ is your second chance. 
me really well. I've used so many chances. Don't, hey, don't worry. You haven't gotten to the second chance yet because when you get to him, problems get solved. Don't mistake what I'm saying. I'm not suggesting you're going to be perfect. That's coming. But we who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord are still going to need a change. Come on now. That, that was a good message all by itself. And I'm as excited as I'm going to get for the rest of my life. So <laughs> the Lord gave me the thought right at the end of the message that his approval of you began when he made Adam. Because the very first sperm cell and, by the way, the very first egg cell came into its existence when God made Adam because it was from Adam that he made the woman. Okay. And God approved. Did that... Was that too common? God approved. He did say it was good. Right. And he approved Adam. And he approved the woman. And he approved every single one of their offspring. Because he knew from that moment, actually long before moments existed, he knew every human being that would ever be born and those who would be aborted before they were born. And he approved. And he became the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. That means if it was possible for grass to commit sins, he covered it. If it was possible for a star to go awry, he covered it. Praise the name of the Lord. What a great God. What a great God. So you can consider yourself with all of your flaws and all of your failures, all the things that don't go right and that you do wrong, and understand that none of that is the issue decider. He is the issue decider. And when we call upon him for that mercy, he gives it. Praise the name of the Lord. Come on, praise the name of the Lord. Lord, we want to thank you for the word of God that is forever settled in heaven. And that word which is spoken that makes things happen in this creation of yours. We thank you, Lord, for making it more vital to our understanding so that we can begin recognizing exactly the power that you demonstrate in our lives every day. Thank you for your grace to us, Lord, your willingness to reveal yourself to us. Thank you for your mercy, your looking beyond our faults, seeing our need and supplying all that we have ever and will ever have need of. You're our God, Lord Jesus, and we praise and honor you ask your dismissal from our service this morning and bring us back together in spirit if not in body tonight for the service and we praise you for it in Jesus name. Amen. Lord bless you.